Aaron Tay, and I'm a student from Concordia International School, Shanghai. Um, I love math, I love chess, I love physics, I love aerospace engineering, but today I'm going to talk about big data. So, big data was a one semester course in our high school, and it was taught by my teacher, Dr. Peter Tong. And um, throughout the course, we used um, many different resources. It was a student led course, and we used this book called Big Data by Victor Meyer. Schoenberger and Ken Koops here, and we did many things like student-led presentations, we did a World War II history exploration in, in um, collaboration with um, our AP World History class, and we also did a final project, which is kind of what this is about. So um, for our final project, we got to choose anything that we wanted to do, anything that we were passionate about, and I love chess, so you can see yeah, uh, I've been playing chess since I was five years old. I've developed a very long passion, a very lifetime, uh, lifelong passion in chess, and there's nothing I don't like about chess. I love chess. So I decided to use my interest in chess together with my interest in big data and uh, the analytical concepts that I took up from the course, and I wanted to do something with that for my final project. So what I decided to do was I wanted to see if I could create a predictive model that could uh, draft, that could um, determine the result of a chess game the court's actually played. So mi millions of chess games are being played every year, and it'll be, it'll be very powerful if I could predict the result of any of those chess games. And I'm trying to find variables. I want to determine certain variables that will drive the result of a chess game, and then implement them into a predictive model, and I want to use Watson analytics to help me with that. So, Luckily for me, I have a huge data set with me already. So I use this application called Chessbase. It's an application that every single chess player uses in the whole world, without exception. So there is no there is no competitor to this application because everything that you need for chess can be done in Chessbase. This is this is what the application looks like on the inside. And together with that, I have a six million game database from the Week in Chess. It's a weekly download and it's free. So I have six million games at my disposal. 6 million essentially data, uh, statistical data sets that I can use to that I can use to create this predictive model. And there are more than a dozen variables attributed to every single one of these games. So for example, you can see that we have the game number, which is not very important. We have the players, we have the result of course, we have the ratings for both players, uh, the number of moves played, the opening played, uh, the tournament name, the date, and some other things like round number, sometimes there's an annotator, and of course the game itself, every single move. Every single move for every single competitive game is stored in this database, so it's quite a powerful database. So, the first thing I have to do is get that from, uh, transfer the data set from Chessbase into Watson Analytics, which was quite a big, quite a big problem, because Chessbase is run on Windows, and I use a Mac, so I have, I have a virtual machine, I have transferred that from Chess base, which is not very compatible with Excel or anything like that, and I have to transfer that into Watson Analytics. So what I did was, uh, it took me about four steps to do it. So the first thing I did was I found this application called ChessPad2. It allowed me to load games into this kind of format and save it as an HTML file. And what I had to do after that was open up the HTML file, uh, select everything, paste it into an Excel file, save that, and then upload it onto Watson Analytics, and that's how it was done. So this is what it looks like on the Excel file. I copied it here, and then I brought it into Boston Analytics by uploading it this way. So what I had to do was, first of all, find some potential variables that may contribute to the result of the game. So since I have experience in chess, I, know, I can already know what kind of variables may drive the result of the game. For example, the date, may, the, the date probably has no, the date has probably no contribution to what to influence the result of the game, but some other variables will. And using my knowledge in chess and my experience in chess, I can narrow down the variables so I don't have to check every single one of them. And it creates for a more efficient and faster process for developing a model. So for example, um, ELO rating is a, uh, is a determinant of a player's strength. So every single chess player has it. Uh, I'm not sure how many people have played chess here. Does anyone? Do you play chess? Play chess. Do any of you have ELO, uh, ELO ratings? No. ELO ratings. So you can see this is a list of top, the top 40 best chess players. I'm not there, of course, but you see their ratings there. So it's a quite a simple system. 
everyone has a rating. The higher your rating is, the stronger you are. And if I beat a chess player, for example, if I beat a very strong chess player, I'll gain 19 rating points. If I lose to a very weak player, I will lose 19 rating points. And let's say I draw against a very strong chess player, I may gain 9 points. So it's a simple system where you gain and lose rating points based on how well, how well you do against other players. So it, is, it, it definitely has to be a very strong predictor for uh, the result of the game because the higher your ELO rating, the higher chance you have, well, the stronger you are basically. So, but does that, does that mean that the higher, uh, does that mean that the higher your rating is, um, you should be predicted to win a result? It's not necessarily that um, if you have a higher rating, you're just going to win the game. There's a, there's a question of to what extent, um, so to what extent your rating difference has to be before this uh, ELO rating difference makes, a, makes an impact on the chance of you winning a game. So this is one of the variables that I have to consider. The number of moves of a game can also matter uh, in terms of predicting the result of a game because um, from, from experience in playing chess, and maybe this may make sense to some people who play chess, the longer your game goes on for, the more pieces are exchanged off. And the more pieces are exchanged off, uh, the higher chance it's going to be a draw. So at the beginning of the game, there's a lot of uncertainty because there are many pieces, but then the longer the game goes on, the, more, um, the, the higher the chance that the game will end in a draw. So this may be applicable for a predictive model, but um, if you were just talking about predicting the, game of res uh, the result of a game before it's played, it's not very useful because you don't know you don't know how long, you don't know how long a game is going to last for before it's actually played. So though this might show up in the predictive model, uh, I have to be careful to exclude this because it's not very good for predicting the result of a game before it's actually played. So piece color is another one uh, that I have to consider because. Chess, unfortunately, is not a symmetric game. It's a move-by-move -move game, so one player always has to go first. And whoever goes first, white goes first, will always have an advantage at the start of a game. So you might say that uh, piece color, the color that you're playing will definitely increase, or the color that you're playing will definitely influence the result of your game. If you play white, you probably have a higher chance. But to what extent does this happen? You can see um, this is a computer analysis, and this is just my computer that I use. It's like an analysis engine, and I don't know if you can see very clearly, it's showing positive numbers because at the start of the game, white will always have an advantage. If you plug in, if you plug in the starting position to any computer, it will show that white has an advantage because white has the first move. So this is another variable I have to consider. Uh, chess opening choice. So if you did see before, um, there was something called eco written in one of the columns, and that's that's the opening code of the game. So. In chess, every opening is coded from A00 to E99. So A00, A01, all the way to E99. And certain openings have different characters. Different openings have different characteristics. So for example, although uh, you may not play chess, but if you take a look at the two, the two positions here, one of them looks sharper than the other. Which one looks, uh, for those of you who play chess, which one looks more interesting? Which position looks more interesting? So this position is almost completely symmetrical. In fact, it's completely symmetrical. And um, this one's not very interesting. So in this opening, uh, the chances of a draw are definitely higher than the chances in that opening up there. So this is called the Slav defense. That one's called the Kings Indian. So that one, that in that position, there may be higher chances for uh, decisive results, so wins rather than draws. So the opening that's played will actually, or may, so for example, this, that's E74, and I did a quick statistical analysis there, and it shows 43% chance for white, 43% uh, of the time white wins, 26% uh, of the time black wins, and then there's a drop 31% of the time. But if you compare that to the other position, this one, uh, there's a 71% chance for a draw, 15% for white wins, and 14% for black wins. So uh, this position is clearly less sharp, or not as sharp as the other one, and therefore there's a higher chance for so the opening choice might affect the result of the game too. So there are many variables that do this. Round number is one of them. So when you play a tournament, your incentive to win changes with each round. Usually, when people start tournaments, they uh, they have a stronger drive to win the game, and then uh, and in the later rounds, that drive kind of dies down. So you usually see more draws. So when I do end up analyze this predictive model, hopefully I can see that happening. The average player strength, so if you're talking about the player strength, that would be ELO. So 
what I'm saying here is that the average strength of the players will also make a difference in terms of the results because two weak players when they play against each other, they on average they'll make more mistakes and the more mistakes they make, the more chances there are for one player to win. Whereas if you have two strong players, um, they will make very few mistakes and the chance for a draw will increase. So even though two players may have the same rating, depending on how high that rating is, the chance of them winning or losing, uh, winning or losing or drawing is kind of different. So um, I'll show you how I did in Watson Analytics right now, and hopefully we can find a really good model for that. So I use an exploration here. So we begin with just, um, we'll just begin with, I'll clear all these filters right Okay, first of all, you can see that um, I didn't actually use the entire database to do this thing because uh, Watson Analytics, Analytics actually limited me to 100,000 uh, 100, rows, so I just used 100,000 games. Uh, I used 100,000 random games, so hopefully it is reflected, it, it is reflected on um, the actual model or what I'm trying to achieve. So the first thing you might see is that, um, first of all, uh, Watson Analytics recognize 1-0, which is white wins as a date, January 1st, 2000, which is not too good, but uh, we'll go with it anyway. So you might see that white, this is, the, this is just the result. This is just the result straight out, and it shows that uh, white wins about 38% of the time, black wins 31% of the time, and uh, about 30% of the time is a draw. So that already proves that peace color is, an, is a contributing variable in this in this predictive model because white wins more than black in this case. So I just tested these variables one at a time. This is for this one was for peace color and now I'm going to test for um, yellow. So what I did was um, I did a ELO difference. So I subtracted the black ELO from the white ELO and hopefully from this I can from changing this I'll be able to see a difference in ELO in the in uh, ELO difference or the impact of ELO difference. So I set this to zero right now, and I set I just set this to zero. And I set the other one to um, very close to it. For example, just here, uh, and I slowly drag it up. You'll see that you'll see that uh, white's chances of increase uh, white's chances of winning will drastically increase the more I drag this slider across. Because uh, so the ELO difference is now negative two, which is not not a telling story. But if I slowly drag this upwards, you can see now uh, white wins about. 33% of the time, black wins maybe um, slightly under 25% of the time. And if I drag this across and the ELO difference becomes larger and larger and larger, you see that white's, white's chances of winning is increasing drastically the, lot, the more I drag this over. So you can see that happening. And the more I drag this, the greater chance that white is going to win the game. That way. You can see it the other way too. So let's say black has the advantage. Black has the advantage. So I can drag this, I can filter out all games where white has higher ELO and drag the other one downwards. So the more I drag this this way, the greater chance that black is going to win the game. So the black one is the blue over there, and I can drag this left. And the more I drag this, the greater the chance that black is going to win the game. So in that, you can, quite, you can quite see quite clearly that uh, ELO difference or your rating, your rating does matter in terms of how, how likely it is that you win the game. So that's another variable. Round right here. So if I just set it to round one, let's let's see the distribution of round one. So so this is the distribution for round one. You see how uh, light wins. Uh, about 40% of the time, black wins about 40% of the time. So it's mostly wins. 
But let's say I set it to, for example, a later round. Let's say round is nine in the tournament. You can see that the results have drastically changed. The percentage of draws has greatly increased and the percentage of wins has greatly decreased. So round is another variable that I have to consider in the model. Yield average, if you try this one as well, and uh, I created another variable to do this with, which is right here. So if I, if I just drag the yield average down to, to um, very low, you can see that the percentage of wins becomes, um, is greater. So the pieces of, for white wins and black wins is a much greater percentage. But the more I drag this over to the right, the, the greater the chance for drops. So if, you'll see that the green section in this graph will increase drastically as I drag this across. So all these variables that I considered, they mostly do, they do have an impact on the game. So I need to enter them into a predictive model to see which ones will come out. So I'm going to do that right now. So if I enter them all into a predictive model and I see what Watson analytics uh, picks up, you can see what kind of you can see which variables are most likely most likely um, most likely impact the results. So here it shows that um, black ELO, uh, well the ELO difference and round are the biggest indicators for uh, the biggest um, drives for the result of the game. It shows a predictive strength of, I believe, 59%. Yes. So, so it shows that. So I can flip through the decision tree and show you the decision tree and show you that. Um, so it shows, shows, shows here in this, in this one that uh, you can see how when the yellow difference is large and the browns are lower, uh, the chance of black winning is really great, and the, when the yellow difference is small, then so this predictive model is about 59% uh, accurate, and it shows that although ELO difference is the biggest indicator for, or the biggest uh, driver for results, round also plays an influence on the result of the game. So what happened to all the other variables that were missing, all the other variables that I saw? Well, I think there are some, I think it turns out that there are some limitations to what Watson Analytics can do right now, because uh, if you remember opening code, um, from a, the codes from A00 to E99, they're all discrete. Uh, they're all discrete, although it's a quantitative variable. They're discrete quantitative variables because um, Watson Analytics recognizes each one of them as an individual code instead of instead of like a, a string of codes or like a like a counting variable. So, from a chess player's point of view, there are there are connections between each 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 code. For example, C01 and C02 are connected in some way, but Watson Analytics can't play chess, so it doesn't know that. So it sees them at each, as each uh, as discrete variables, and therefore cannot predict the trend in that way. For example, why is why does the move number show up on the on the predictive model? Maybe it's because first of all, you can't predict you cannot predict the number of moves before it's, uh, before the game is actually played, and maybe because uh, each player may have a different play style, and uh, therefore the number of moves each player's average number of moves may not be taken into account in this uh, predictive model. So there are many limitations to the way uh, Watson Analyst analytics can read the data right now, and hopefully in the future, with more, um, with more tools and uh, more powerful tools being implemented into Watson Analytics, I will be able to use more variables in my predictive model and hopefully predict something, uh, create a predictive model that's even more accurate than this one. Time for one question, folks. <clears throat> I have one. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that your sample set was a uh, thousand games out of this much larger database. No, it was a hundred thousand games. Hundred thousand games. Yeah. That's right. Sorry, my apologies. Okay. Um, how did you choose the subset of games that you processed from the larger data set? I 
I just used the chest space and I randomized the order and I just picked the first one. Oh, you just randomly. Oh, yes. Cool. Randomly. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much.